welcome to everyone. Oops. Okay. <laughs> I was distracted by the recording in progress. So good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, second session of the 2023 Global Diaspora Virtual Exchanges on Effective Strategies to Boost Development. I'm delighted to see your engagement in sharing best practices on how to communicate and deliver impactful messages. Our first virtual exchange held last month focused on impactful skills in communication. The three main objectives were one, breaking down the skills that communicators need when approaching donors. The second one was identifying the characteristics that makes diaspora unique communicators. And third, defining the channels to effective communications and tips to target audiences. And during the event, we had the opportunity to learn from diaspora organizations and identify the specific characteristics that successful communicators have, such as active listening, that is, successful communicators are ready to listen to their communities, partners and donors, and leaders understand the needs of their communicate communities and tailor their projects accordingly. The second was effective use of social media, know how to engage effectively online with their interlocutors by expressing objectives clearly and crafting tailored messages and use social media networks to maximize and engage with their partners and public. And the third was integration of multicultural experiences. Diasporas are unique communicators because they know and understand specific groups of people and adapt easily to the environment they interact with. And diasporas hold a global view and understanding of other people's backgrounds, and they have the power to act as bridges between cultures and, and localities. So we're, we were particularly impressed by our panelists composed by young and experienced female diaspora leaders. And it was a space that proved how meaningful and straightforward it is to integrate the views, experiences and knowledge across different generations and diverse backgrounds. So we're pleased to continue providing the space together with our partners and build on the knowledge and capacities of diaspora through the unique set of skills they bring to the table in these global diaspora virtual exchanges. We had already two successful exchanges hosted in 2021 and 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021, respectively, in which through a multi-stakeholder approach, participants shared their best practices to support diaspora to reach the full potential and achieve a greater engagement towards sustainable development. And these 20, the, the, now the 2023 virtual exchanges respond to the request made by diaspora organizations in the Global Diaspora Week that was co-organized by the Global Diaspora Confederation, where the relevance of capacity building to create impactful and sustainable initiatives was emphasized. And we're convinced that by sharing this space, we are collectively accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, as well as Objective 19 of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration on uh, creating conditions for migrants and diasporas to fully contribute to sustainable development in all countries. So I am particularly happy uh, to make available this convening space of IOM in this new session. And I'm particularly thrilled to welcome young members of the diaspora to these exchanges. In today's session, we will be hearing about the specific strategies our diaspora leaders use in their day-to-day -day interactions and project implementation. And more concretely, our speakers will further unpack the, the main objectives of the sessions, which are firstly, identifying strategic communication to implement uh, diaspora projects. Second, defining the key considerations to be aware when trying to communicate effectively. Third, examining how diasporas and partners engage by sharing the impacts of their activities. And finally, evaluating how diasporas can further align their goals with their communication strategy. I'm, and I'm confident that these um, and their expertise will shed light on the techniques 
from which all of us can benefit and start putting them into practice. So I look forward to learning more from the ASPA organizations and how IOM and partners can continue collaborating towards the acceleration of the Agenda 2030. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me with you. And uh, uh, and now I would like to give the floor to Patti Siyanga, co-vice president of the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and uh, Transnationalism, who will be moderating the session. Over to you, Paddy. Thank you, Monica, um, for that inspiring opening uh, remarks that you've shared with us this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. We plan to be here for um, just a, a, a less than two hours now. And with those opening remarks, just making sure also that everybody is comfortable, but also comfortable in the language. So we do have interpretation um, available, and you would just uh, be able to see that we have it in Spanish, in French, and in English. And you've got a, a button somewhere in your device that would show you and lead you to the language of your choice so that you're able to engage with us. It's a very exciting time, as Monica uh, has said. I always like to moderate sessions where we have uh, leaders in the diaspora space, particularly when it's women, uh, particularly when um, it's such a diverse group that we also have here with us. And I think, as Monica has alluded to, these virtual dialogues and exchanges have been happening uh, for the last couple of years. I'm really glad that GRFDT was able to participate in the last ones that even led to a publication where we do a lot of learning. And I think that's a very important word, uh, even coming out of Monica's uh, uh, speaking remarks about how we use these platforms really to learn. And it's really important for us to learn who are in the diaspora space, to learn from each other, uh, a lot of cross-learning, but also particularly to look at uh, a lot of the strategies and information that is shared by different diaspora leaders that uh, uh, supporters of diaspora organizations, that supporters of diaspora platforms can be able to uh, pick from as we support diaspora engagement and the diversity of the work that is in that particular space. So today I am absolutely delighted to be moderating this session today. Um, we are joined by three fantastic panelists, um, and if you will allow me, I will call them my sisters, not just because we hail from the same continent, but I think that we are very like-minded, uh, and I think I get a lot of inspiration from the three women that are joining us on the panel today. So on our panel today, we have Teresa Fianco, who is the founder and managing director of Diaspora Digital News, and a search on the internet will show you the wealth of information that is shared on that platform, and we'll hear a little bit more from Teresa, who is an integrated marketing communications and media uh, expert. And she is the founder of the, the, the broadcasting platform that particularly looks at what is happening around global social impact through the diaspora digital news. And uh, through this journey, she has also transitioned to become a co-author of um, uh, empowering global diasporas in the digital in the digital era, and in this particular uh, and, and in this particular one, this will be a free ebook that would be uh, that was made available that really looks at medium and small uh, enterprises and how uh, they have uh, transitioned uh, through the peak of the COVID pandemic. Uh, Teresa, we are really glad that you're here to join us, and I will uh, ask in a moment if my panelists can turn on their screen so we can see her. Hello, my sister. Uh, hope you are doing well. Um, and uh, joining us also is from the Global Diaspora Confederation is Vivian Nakwalobi Ibeji, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Vivian, otherwise we're, we're in for a training on how I should pronounce your name correctly. And she is the coordinator of the Global Diaspora Confederation uh, since 2020, and she has been supporting various uh, teams there in many different functions, and most importantly, uh, helping to organize the Global Diaspora Week that would take place at the end of every year, another important, uh, important and exciting space where diaspora uh, meet to engage. She's also worked around setting up the Global Diaspora Humanitarian Hub, and um, through, through her own experience as a biochemist, uh, she implements various projects and interventions at the Clinton Health Access Initiative and uh, Médecins Sans Frontières before she joined GDC. And she is coming from Nigeria. 
uh, and we'll be very happy to hear a little bit more about her work there as a lead coordinator in some of uh, GDC's important work around uh, coordination. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, Jacqueline Achien-Kun, who is the co-founder of Kenyan Women in Germany. And by profession, she's a nurse, um, having worked in health management. Uh, she founded Kenyan, health, uh, Kenyan Women in Germany and as a sense of creating this community for Kenyan women to build their lives once they have moved here in Germany. Germany, far away from their home country and supporting them with various tools, uh, information, her home as well, and creating a, a great platform in terms of social and economic and emotional support that's provided. And the organization has over 2,000 members and caters, by the way, also for men and other nationalities. Uh, and she is a mother of two young adults and settled here in Germany. So really happy to have this um, diversity of, uh, of uh, panelists that are joining us here today. And how we're going to move is we just try and relax it down. As diaspora, we say that we are relaxed people and we just want to bring out the richness of the conversation. So we would like also that the audience can engage with us. The chat function is open, if I'm not mistaken. Let us know where you're joining us from. Let us know what it is that you're doing. Uh, often we don't have the possibility of having many people on these panels. And the idea with the panelists is that they trigger a lot of what uh, 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 they trigger in you information you would like to share through the chat, they can resonate, you can share comments. So we would take this as a moment as though we were sitting in the same room and be able to engage. So with the panel um, this afternoon, we'll try to be as interactive as we can be in, in, in laying it down. I will present to the panel a couple of questions, but it will really be in an interactive mode. We may lose track of some of the questions, but that is okay. What is important for us is to be able to exchange and for us to share. And we will have a moment uh, for us to hear from the audience and for us to um, make a reflection in back again with our panelists. And so for um, just uh, this first set of questions, even as we go in, I will I will ask Jackie uh, just to kick us off. Jackie, maybe would you speak to us a little bit about what strategic communication, um, you know, why is it relevant in the implementation of diaspora projects and particularly in the work that you do as Kenyan women in Germany? Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paddy, for such a beautiful introduction. And um, I, I must say, I'm, I am honored to be on the platform as a panelist. And uh, welcome to all my other panelists. Uh, we, we had a chance of seeing each other. Good afternoon to all those who joined. Yes, Paddy, uh, first of all, I must say, I must introduce Quig shortly to tell you exactly what Quig does. Quig means Kenyan women in Germany. And uh, this is a, a preserved place for the women where they can have, it's a closed place where women can preserve their family unit. And what we also do is we try to empower them so that they can contribute in both social and economic development in both Germany and their home countries. So back to the question of why um, uh, the strategic communication is relevant in implementation of uh, diaspora project. Here, I will go and dissect it and divide it into two. The first part of it is we are diasporans. Where are these projects? Which kind of projects are we talking about? Are we talking of the projects that we are doing over here in Germany, or also the projects that the diasporans are doing back in their mother, in their home countries or, or country of origin? For instance, for me, it is Kenya. So this, when I go to this home monetary project, we have things like M-Pesa. This enables me to, uh, enables me and other Kenyans or even Tanzanians, I think they also use M-Pesa. It helps us like to have an, um, uh, how do you call that? An effective, uh, uh, it, it has, helps us to mobilize the, um, the resources very effectively. And it gives that flow and we can do a follow-up. And if we comes in terms of visibility, like Quig is working with municipalities. Uh, Did somebody say something? Ah, okay, sorry. It was just an interruption. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, when it comes to in terms of the visibility of what the work of the sponsors, and we work with different kinds of sponsors, we work with the embassies as well, we work with the uh, municipality as well. So here is where for us it is very important to meet the expectations. This helps us so that we can show them exactly what's happening and they can do a follow up. This is where they, um, uh, the uh, how do how do how do I, how am I going to put that? Um, I'm actually out of words now. Yeah, I'm sorry about this, but uh, I'm kind of sweating, <laughs> but I'm okay. I know I'm under, among my sisters and brothers. Yeah, this helps us to have that wider and broader outreach to these people. And that is what the strategic communication, why it's very uh, relevant during the implementation. Uh, I think I'll make a break here and drink some water to cool down. Thank you very much. Bud. <laughs> Jack, you know, that was a fantastic way to, to kick us off. And um, maybe we can hear also uh, a little bit more about how you see uh, effective communication for some of the homeland projects, uh, as you have said, and how that, you know, has played a role in terms of the kind of tools that you use uh, for follow up and for monitoring uh, of the various projects, but we can come back to you as we circle uh, back and I'll move on to, to Vivian. Uh, just also Vivian bringing in uh, uh, the same question that I have posed to Jackie, but you know, looking at the important work that GDC uh, is doing and particularly you've got the seven action, uh, these seven activities that um, and, and communication uh, features uh, quite prominently there. Did you want to just walk us through and let us know why you think strategic communication is relevant in the implementation of diaspora projects? Thank you, Paddy. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Strategic communication is the backbone of every project, in my opinion, because you have a vision, you have a purpose. You need to effectively communicate that purpose to your beneficiaries or your target audience for them to understand that, okay, this is what you have in mind. And if it aligns with their needs, then you're going to have project sustenance, which in the end is what every project aims at to be sustained. So effective communication also helps for to build trust and partnerships between government of home countries. Oftentimes, that organizations have issues with government of your home countries. It has it has it has been a conversation that has been had over and over again. But when you communicate your ideas effectively, because oftentimes there are good intentions that are lost in the line of communication, this is why you have to adopt effective communication understand where your beneficiaries are coming from and understand your own purpose as an organization. During the development of the Global Diaspora Humanitarian Hub, we had constant lessons with diaspora organizations. We organized meetings where we had them come in and explain their needs, explain um, their challenges. We had discussions around what it is that they actually needed, recommendations and opinions. And at each phase of the project, we kept them in the loop of things. This way, the field is part of the project, the field as though they are part of the project, and then it makes it easier to implement the project. Also, it helps to avoid duplication of efforts. There are so many diaspora organizations working in different diaspora communities. You don't want to have your efforts duplicated, rather go into partnerships with these diaspora organizations, because in the end, you have one goal, you want for the betterment of the diaspora communities. So in a nutshell, effective communication, in my opinion, helps in project sustenance, implementation, partnerships, to build trust and to avoid duplication. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, and I feel like this is almost uh, um, uh, a question that we will pass on to Teresa, working in the space of communication and uh, very passionate about it in terms of spreading um, the important work uh, around diaspora news. Um, uh, Teresa, when you think about this question and when we talk about sort of strategic um, communication and in impl implementation of diaspora projects. I mean, you yourself having been a member of the diaspora and now sort of running this platform with this important news that you try to, to reach out to various audiences. What do you really think is the space for strategic communication? Thank you, Paddy, and to the organizers. I'm really honored to be part of the panel. So first of all, like the other panelists have said, communication is just the 
exchange of information. So it's through different mediums. And um, how the sender communicates will greatly influence how the receiver takes the message. So that's why we talk about strategic communication because the co it's, it, it has to be with an effect, a positive effect. So strategic communication in diaspora, it, it's type of communication that works for the diaspora sector. So this can be short term or long term, depending on the project that the diaspora um, organization or the government or whichever stakeholder has. And so the outcome of the communication, strategic communication, it should achieve the goals of the project. It should fulfill the mission. It should align with the vision. So it shouldn't just be any kind of com uh, communication, but it should be tailor made to suit each project. That is why there's no like one fit approach when it comes to strategic communications. But then there's a way we can do it such that we, we have like basic guidelines where we can follow. So that for each project, we make sure that from um, planning, initiation, execution, closure of the project management process, we are well aligned. Um, all stakeholders are all aligned. So translating this into um, diaspora project, I have worked more in the media. So this has given me the opportunity to work with different sectors of diaspora, like humanitarian sectors, entrepreneurship, um, arts, culture, identity, and many more. And so uh, because diaspora projects, uh, diasporas are basically a diverse group. So their projects cut across um, various sectors. So because of that, uh, strategic communication is really important because it can be used as a very effective tool to correct misconceptions, stereotypes surrounding communities to a large extent. It can also be used to introduce an idea, disseminate information, and also garner interest for projects that, um, are, that are in the diaspora. We can also use it to mobilize resources in times of crisis. You can, uh, we know, for example, um, Turkey, what happened in Turkey, we can see, I can see a representative of uh, DMARC here. They use their platform to mobilize resources. We've had uh, the GDC also doing the same. So it depends on how you communicate. You could use that as a tool to mobilize resources during crisis as, as well. We can use it for skills development, um, information for mapping, capacity building. And so there are various um, advantages of doing communications the right way in that it should be strategic and um currently or in this era we are in the era of technology where we can leverage um digitization to bridge the gap between um communications among various stakeholders so in acknowledging that there are a few guide guidelines that in my own experience that I, I, I put down that we can consider when developing strategic communication plans for diaspora project. So during initiation and planning of the project, we should clearly define what we want to communicate to our audience. We should know who the stakeholders are as well. And then in execution, we should know which channel we are communicating to because now we have both traditional and digital channels. So if you are, for example, you're uh, communicating to a second generation diaspora of Latin America, you would, you would want to use a digital platform. You wouldn't want to use the traditional platform. So the communication strategy has to include all that. And it should have a timeline where you can also measure and track the process. So for me, it's, it's really important that we approach communications in a very strategic way if we want to achieve our goals um, with diaspora projects. Thank you. Teresa, thank you so much. And I think as a, uh, as a segue, just circling back to, to Jackie, when you, know, when you talked about the Homeland projects and in terms of monitoring, I think even when we just did the prep call um, was really interesting. Maybe you wanted to share with us a little bit more about some of those monitoring tools uh, from uh, social media platforms that you use in terms of tracking progress, um, as, as Teresa has alluded to. Jackie? 
Um, that is actually uh, uh, what Teresa just said. You should know exactly which group of people you are communicating with. That is very important so that you can choose your tool properly. Because there are quite a number of, um, of channels to reach out uh, in uh, uh, people. So Teresa mentioned about the traditional way and the, uh, the, uh, the advanced way, let me put it that way, uh, for lack of better words. Like recently, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a podcast uh, that I took part in, and that is also a way of advertising or telling the people out there on how diaspora uh, is working out here, the diaspora groups, different diaspora groups. It is not only that we are there to beg and to wait to be done for, but it's also a way to show it out there and to tell people we are also helping. For instance, when the case of, um, uh, of Ukraine came up, you have to know, how do I approach these vulnerable people? The way you communicate to them is different from the way you're going to communicate to somebody who is um, actually here to look for a, uh, a school or a university and has not been traumatized by that. So know how to communicate and to which group you can com you're communicating with. That is one, one very important thing. Know the language that you are going to use, know the background and know the culture. Those are very important things that we should never forget when we are communicating because that can help quite a lot. Um, uh, to uh, to further the communication and to get more details of what uh, you want to put across to different um, areas. Yeah, that is exactly it. Thank you, Jackie. And I think uh, that's a good segue also to our, our next question where we are, uh, you know, we're talking about the message, right? Um, so the question really is how can diaspora deliver these strat the strategic messages during the implementation of the project and in sort of also the running of the project? Um, and maybe I make a segue to, to Vivian, uh, coming to you to talk a little bit about platforms, maybe talking to us a little bit also about messaging. Yes, Teresa and Jacqueline had already started. First, to deliver your messages, you need to un understand your audience their state of mind at that point and their group. At GDC, we use social media. Navigating our world since post-COVID, digitalization has become, social media has become a very effective tool for communication. So you also have to understand the group. If you have younger people, there are social media platforms that like TikTok, it, it may be, it may not be very, it may not be very conversant with say, the older generation, but I think the youth now, use a lot of TikTok, but for us at GDC, we use LinkedIn and Facebook. They have proven to be very effective in delivering messages. Also, we share newsletters. You need to make your audience feel like they're a part of you, like you want to understand that plight. For instance, during the Turkey Syria earthquake, we, we held a forum and we did a due diligence. We were sure to empathize, show them that we understood what they're going through. As little as the spelling of Turkey, we had to spell it the Turkish way, just so they realize that, hey, we are well aware of the things that matter to you. And then in maintenance, the question also says about maintenance of the project follow-up. We do a lot of follow-up, send follow-up emails, thank you emails, just keep them engaged and excited about whatever it is you're doing. Let them feel like, yes, they understand us and we are a part of them. So social media is a very effective tool, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, these are platforms we engage, we use in delivering our messages, as well as sharing newsletters and reports of every meetings that we hold. Thank you. No, thanks, Vivian. Um, Teresa, when I when I sort of think about um, Vivian's examples and Jackie's examples around the messaging and the packaging of the messaging, um, uh, what do you sort of see? And I mean, you, you're in the business of packaging these messages uh, uh, and we see that visual on the front end. I wonder how does it look like uh, from the back end? And, you know, what would you then say to, you know, diaspora organizations like Quig uh, and those who are members of the Global um, Confederation, that Global Diaspora Confederation as well, in terms of packaging of these messages for implementation of the project? Teresa? 
Yeah. So when it comes to packaging, um, I realize that there's typically, um, I don't know if it's a stereotype about issues surrounding migration because people see it more as uh, very technical. So what we do as Diaspora Digital is to make it more practical, more fun, more holistic. In that way, we are able to have um, a varied audience base. So um, I would say with packaging, it should be exciting to the audience without losing its essence. You can, you can uh, put out data out there in fun ways. You can do it through trivia, through um, images, graphics, in a way that attracts attention. So when it comes to packaging, it depends on the audience. That might not work with, say, uh, the diplomatic community or the government or typical uh, policymakers. They would not, they might not be so enthused with that. So it uh, all comes down to understanding your audience and knowing which channel, communication channel to use. So based on that, then you can choose um, the language, language as in the meaning you want to convey from your message to that particular audience. So yes, and it, the communication also has to be timely in addition to being me uh, measurable. It should come at the right time. Um, and it should, it should, you know, you should, uh, it should have emotions attached to it. Uh, sometimes people don't know, but languages have emotions attached. So you should have the human feel of it because migration is all about humanity. There's, it's a big part of, migration because it's people usually say oh there are 2000 uh, people here they just mentioned the numbers but these numbers are human beings that you're dealing with the diaspora is made up of human beings that you're dealing with so it, it has to be inclusive even because it's already diverse it has to be inclusive and you also need to um, factor in their emotions to um, professionally communicate the message that you have to give to them. So the packaging has to do with the audience, the, um, the channel you're communicating on and the kind of message you're trying to communicate or the kind of feedback you're trying to get. Because um, gone were the days when um, if you needed feedback, you'd have to do a survey or after people use the products, that's what. But now uh, feedback is on Facebook someone could just go to the comments and put in feedback. So things are very different now. So depending on the current trend, what's going on, you have to be on top of everything in order to have like a strategic communications plan. So yeah, that's what I'll have to say about that. Thank you, Teresa. I saw Jackie nodding her head. Jackie, did you just wanna come in and talk about maybe, um, you know, something more practical from your side uh, and, and in nodding into Teresa's point? Yeah, I nodded uh, when she talked about the emotions and the timely, because uh, that is exactly, if you all remember about, uh, of course you do remember, the Ukraine time when we had the TCNs who were running away and um, kind of uh, not being able to cross, they were being treated differently. That is when the diaspora groups really came in and these diaspora groups were hosting them or helping them to cross over or helping them. I worked with um, Pardi and um, other diaspora groups during that time. And we could actually help them already from uh, within Ukraine and we are still assisting them. So that is creating another face of diaspora. It is not the diaspora that is begging. Uh, it's not the diaspora that is there only for handouts, but the diaspora that is ready uh, to be included in talks and to walk their talk as well. So, uh, and the success of the stories, the way the whole thing ended up and we managed and all other diaspora groups managed to help this, um, TCN students. I think this is something that can never be forgotten. This is something that has to be written out there. And yeah, that is why I was actually nodding. It's quite an emotional story. When we went out there, you could see the unity of different diaspora organizations. And yeah, that is why I was really, really <laughs> nodding. Yeah, thank you, Teresa, for bringing that back again in the house. 
No, thank you. And also for alluding to the point of documentation, I mean, often we're told that as diaspora, diaspora take action, and then it's only a few months later when we have, you know, people like Teresa who work in the space of communicating knowledge, and they would say, so did you write that down? Could you communicate that? You know, do, should this information really go out about and what you're doing? And, you know, often being in this space of where as long as um, uh, needs have been met or needs have been addressed, uh, often very difficult to see that news coming out. And I think the same can be said whether it's remittances, right? The discussion around remittances or investment. Um, the very first news that we saw go out about, uh, you know, the support that diaspora and migrants uh, give to their homelands came through big reports, World Bank reports, you know, quoting all this thing. And then, you know, many countries sort of being surprised when actually the holders of this data would be national governments, you know, and remitters, uh, uh, remitters companies and so on and so forth. So while, you know, where is the documentation and where does it take place? So I think that's a, uh, another important one, I think, in terms of delivering, you know, how can we show the track record of what has been done before as we are taking the next step forward in delivering strategic messages um, around different places? Um, we thought at this point it would be nice to just check in with, uh, with our audience. Um, I can see that messages are coming in the chat. Very nice to see some uh, familiar faces in the room. Uh, bonjour, et bienvenue. Um, I will not try and attempt any Spanish uh, as my skills are very limited in there, but very nice to see so many people joining us from so many different spaces. Let's keep the, the, the chat. Um, at this point, we just wanted to go into the audience. I mean, we've talked about strategic messaging. We've talked about the importance of knowing your audience, but we've also talked about the importance of strategic communication in terms of um, part of the topic on effective strategies for diaspora engagement. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand. We've got about maybe a few minutes that we want to do this for, so that at least we just take uh, check the temperature in the room, um, or you can put your question. I'm going through the chat now to see if we have um, if we have some questions. Very nice to see that people also want to link up. Um, there is a question that has come into, um, into the chat. Uh, and the question is around how diaspora groups, how diaspora groups identify projects and how they communicate these to their beneficiary communities. We will be able to address that question when we come to the last part of the question and answer session. Thank you so much for sharing in this question. Uh, you can put your questions to us in French. You can speak in French. You can write in Spanish uh, and in English as well. Uh, just feel free to share. Or maybe, is there something that you would like to say around effective messaging? Uh, we know that many people who are here in the room uh, are also working in, in the diaspora space and very much engaged. So we want to give this moment uh, for people to feel free to come in and share with us. Um, Paruai, can I put you on the spot to share? Par Parui Sogo? You can just unmute your mic. Just feel free to unmute your mic. Paul Sogan, oui, c'est moi. Oui, oui, allez-y. Je serai court. Euh, je trouve que les diasporas sont liées euh, au pays de leurs origines, mais en tout cas, les membres euh, des, des diasporas n'ont pas lié entre eux. Et nous devons créer des organisations pour, 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 qui doivent euh, 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 lié des membres de la dias de, de, de diaspora. Et c'est tout que je voulais dire. Vous avez compris oui, mon idée? Very clear. Bien sûr, merci. Merci pour votre contribution. Um, and, and indeed, uh, very, very relevant points coming out there. Thank you so much um, for sharing in um, and I can see a couple of other familiar faces, uh, familiar names in the audience. So I take my hand as moderator to also be able to call upon Mbemba. I know I can see you are in there. Alexi would also be nice to, to hear from you. So I'm calling a few familiar names uh, as they come on to be able to share. Mbemba, the floor is yours uh, over there in Ireland. Just unmute your mic, Mbemba. Super. 
Uh, thank you very much, Paddy, and all the contributors. And I think uh, communication is um, is kind of a good thing also uh, for the diaspora to, to really develop themselves uh, into, especially actors in, in, in terms of delivering projects, but also whether it's, it's the integration and inclusion, but also whether it's like you are trying to get remittances, uh, knowledge about remittance flows, or entrepreneurship and uh, also creating jobs in countries of origin. Um, there are a few things, I think, in terms of communication. I know Teresa, who is a, kind of a specialist in this, runs uh, on uh, online um, information newspaper mentioned about, but one of the, the difficulties with the diaspora organizations, I think, is that we or individuals, we are we are doing so many great things, but people don't know about them. And then part of it is that because we we haven't developed a communication strategy around um, the things that we do. And I know one of the contributors actually mentioned about from the starting point, you need to actually define how, how are you going to communicate uh, what you are doing. So I think this is something that we need to look into, especially nowadays. Things are very easy uh, with the social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Sometimes these messages can be put across through facial expressions, through like using actually maybe even even actors within your own group. Sometimes we, we underrate certain people, especially young people. Young people are very good at communicating outputs and outcomes of projects. So maybe that's what we need to use. I found it interesting as well, especially also if we are at the receiving end of the negative things, we want to challenge that. Sometimes we don't have, we don't have to use what other people are using in terms of fundraising uh, by picturing the negative things about us. We can use illustrations. Illustrations, I found them very interesting to use, whereby you don't actually show the face of an individual, but people can see what you are communicating in terms of your products or the, the, the outcome of your product. So we need to be very creative, but there's a lot of good things that is that are happening and then we are not really communicating about them. So we need to also identify individuals among us who are doing great things about communication, whether they have an online uh, platforms, newspaper, for them to be aware of the things that we do, because their listenership or the people they touch actually is a wide range of professionals globally, and then maybe link up with these people to see our 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 work is also. Prominent. But there's a lot. Um, I, I'm actually I have been listening today, and then I kind of uh, learn a lot from the contributor. So thank you so much for this. Bemba, thank you so much uh, in highlighting um, that particular point, uh, really us being able to identify people who can tell our stories. Uh, how do we identify and how do we make sure that these stories actually are being told? Thank you so much. Um, we will move on to the next set of questions and we will have an opportunity again for others to be able to share with us in the next set. Um, but just coming back again into the panelists, I think, um, the two contributions that we have also got have sort of set up in, in a way of us talking about results, right? Um, and just wondering, and I, I will start off with Teresa uh, here again, you know, how do you see diaspora and partners share the results of their activities? What does that look like in your view? And, and maybe also you could talk about what you think could be, you know, some of the best practices that you have seen uh, from your experience. Teresa, the floor is yours. Okay, so when it comes to communication, um, if um, in the communication school, they will tell you that to have a holistic way of um, communication, there has to be a meaning to the message. Um, there has to be a meaning, a message, and it has to be shared. So if there's a meaning to the message, it's understood, but it's not shared, then the communication is not Whole. So it's really important to um, for um, actors in the diaspora space to share um, their results with each other. And by doing this, it deepens collaboration um, and cooperation among different diaspora um, um, actors or stakeholders. So um, technology, for example, has made it easier for us to share results, experiences. So what works in the European diaspora could 
even work in the African diaspora because of the basic principles that are used. The situations might be different, but with set guidelines from the success of one diaspora project, it can be replicated in another continent or another place. Even with traditional models, it can be done through policy. So it enables um, collaboration, deepens ties between different diaspora groups. And also, um, I'll say that um, it garners interest for diaspora projects because people have kind of one way that is changing now view of diaspora. So it should be about remittance. It should be about business. It should be about money. That's why recently the African diaspora um, organized a conference in uh, Silicon Valley. And the topic that caught my attention, one of the topics was that it was beyond remittance. So even it's a business project with various business actors, entrepreneurs, other, but they were looking at diasporas beyond remittance. So if we know what the diaspora, various people are doing, various projects, they would it would create a different impression of what the diaspora can contribute. Of course, remittance is important, but there's a whole, there's skill sets, there's heritage, there's culture. There's a lot of things that um, diasporas can contribute beyond remittances. So if we share our um, success stories or uh, the impact of our activities, we'd be able to, um, others would also be able to learn and also take a cue from that as well. So yeah. and. If these kind of events, if we organize joint events, for example, this event we are organizing, it has people from all around the world. It's a platform for various people. I mean, all panelists have different bounds. So bringing everything together, the audience also sharing their experiences. So it's, it's an enabling factor for a better diaspora engagement. So yes, it's without sharing, our uh, experience, uh, the impact of our activities, even the challenges we could share and learn from it, then the communication process is not complete. So it's really important that we have um, open forums like these, we have events and um, projects, collaborate on projects that enable us to share our experiences for better diaspora engagement. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Jackie, how do you see Kenyan women in Germany in terms of sharing your activities? How do you share um, uh, the work that Kenyan women in Germany do um, and as well as your partners? What does that look like in your space? Sorry, I'd muted myself. <laughs> Okay, we, there are different platforms where we do share these, but um, what I should mention, uh, the most important thing is we do have, we do organize events. Like on the 3rd of September, we are going to have um, uh, our AGM, that is the annual uh, general meeting. Uh, in, it's going to be in Mines. So when we are there, that is where we showcase all the things that we do, the networking, we showcase the work streams that we do have, like the domestic violence group, like the career and uh, career, uh, career hub and integration part of it and youth and um, youth and young adults. So, and the other thing is, um, uh, by writing out uh, general uh, uh, on our website and also writing out uh, on newsletters to send out to people. What Teresa just said that, uh, uh, I think it was Teresa, yes, about remittances, let me go away from quick a bit. Uh, uh, it is important, but some of these things come unplanned. Like we had this, I will go back to Ukraine because that's what actually the youngest project that we had. You wake up in the morning and your days begins like, uh, oh, there's a project already. So you start with that project that is there. So when we did that and we got like uh, the students coming in, what how we managed to convince these people to take some of these students is them studying here as diasporans. It is a win-win situation. We have the aging German uh, um, population, and we have the young Turks coming, uh, young diasporans coming in. 
So as exposing them out there, and uh, saying, okay, this is going to be a win-win situation for here and for our home countries. They also, we also try to organize events whereby they are coming from here with what they've learned, of course, the country where they were, their country of origin, most of them were like, oh, now you're taking our young, skilled young guys, though they, some of them could not offer them uh, to finish their schooling. But we said, look here, why don't we organize for something that whatever knowledge that they've gained here, now we have a project uh, started by one of uh, the doctors over here, who is also Kenyan. And they take, he takes the guys who done doctor here, uh, who, who are doctors, let me say medical doctors, and they have to work over there, like to offer this, whatever they learned here, they go once in a year to Kenya and uh, these are neurosurgeons. So this is something that it comes out in the newspapers. It comes out over here. It shows actually the acquired skill that is not only being remitted, but this is the skill that they've learned here that is also being brought back there and not only in a monetary manner, the remittances. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa, for that. So these are some of the ways that we could actually uh, uh, we could use uh, to show the results of whatever projects that we are doing over here. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a that's a good one. I think in terms of highlighting this cultural social capital that uh, diaspora would have. So while remittances, it's always very easy to see. You know, it's almost as though the the story of remittances, everybody from governments to international organizations are waiting to see wow. how much money is going to be remitted to particular countries, uh, because you know reports have to be published, but also a lot of advocacy messages are being um, built out of it. I think what's also important is the fact that there is a lot that may not pass through central bank systems uh, of 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 homelands of, of countries of origin, uh, and instead it's much more it's it's even difficult to quantify it and talking about these partnerships jackie i think is particularly important and that some of the cultural capital as well you know we're now seeing diaspora's cultural capital so how are you able to share those results and i think as you said it's by showing what the win-win situations are like the partnerships um you know uh, the skills transfer programs uh is another important part but maybe vivian did you also want to come in and just share with us uh what you see from gdc as some of the ways that diaspora and partners share the results of their activities uh, just like Teresa and jacqueline have said we organize events bring these people back we have series of meetings you may see as those a lot of meetings but then this is how you keep your communication line open you share your results, you organize meetings, and then let them know how far you've gone, what is going on. We also have reports that we write and send via newsletters and also social media. The 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 use of social media cannot be overemphasized because there, just as Teresa mentioned earlier, you can also get your feedback instantly. You let them know this is what's going on. During the Global Diaspora Week of 2022, we had the young students from UCL, UCL make their presentations and you could see a lot of attendees asking for reports because they want to know, they want to see the results of this project, and it is in the works. This is how we share our results. We, we send out our reports regularly, and we also organize more events to have these people come back and see, okay, we had these discussions mm -hmm. in the past, and this is what we have done, this is how far we have gone, so it keeps it open and effective. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, I see we 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 have a hand up. If it were if it is possible, uh, I've just got one more two questions for our panelists, and then we will open the floor for everyone to be able to share with us. Uh, if it's really pressing, uh, I'm more than happy to open the floor. The idea is to have uh, an exchange that's uh, fluid enough that we can ask you to speak. Would you like to share your intervention now? I'm sorry, I do not see your name. It just says invitee because I think you must have pressed a link uh, that was shared by by one of us from. Um, from the host. Do you want to unmute yourself, invitee, and then give us your name and maybe show us a video if it's possible? Okay, we can give you an opportunity when it's time for Q&A uh, for you to come in and share with us. Just coming back into our panel, you know, we've been talking about, for instance, investment conferences. I mean, I know, for instance, Kenya on the, con on the African continent, Ghana, 
Nigeria, uh, and even most recently, Zambia as well as some of those countries, some of the few countries uh, that you have this sort of big display of invest of diaspora conferences that are happening in, in the homeland, pegged to different types of needs. But when we also see um, a growth of diaspora related events, uh, where there's a lot of either fundraising, but that also goes together with um, with with a call for uh, with 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 a display of the different activities that diaspora and their partners use to share these um, these activities. So I just wanted, you know, as a as a question that goes, you know, away from the questions that 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 have been given to our panelists, to to sort of get a sense from you what you sort of see is the the real benefit of national conferences. Um, that are taking place in various places, being organized, co-organized at home, where do you see sort of the value in terms of sharing results and where should they really be going? Uh, anyone is free to take it up. Teresa, can I put you on the spot? Okay, yeah. So for national conferences, um, like you said, there's been a lot. I'll take Ghana and uh, Kenya, for example. So now what we are seeing is that National conferences are now uh, featuring people from the diaspora, from um, with their country of origin. For example, let me use Ghana as an example. So um, people from the Ghanaian diaspora, they feature heavily in uh, conferences about the diaspora, sorry, diaspora in Ghana now. So that way, they also have a different view of how things should be done. And people also who are local, they also kind of have a different view of how things should be done most of the time. So the two of them coming together um, for a conference or to share ideas, they kind of get to a middle ground as in the best practices and how they can replicate it to the local um, market, for lack of a better word. So um, let's say um, there's a way of doing, um, there's a way of communicating in the US that works for the US Sorry, Teresa, um, I think we environment okay. for the yep. Yep. Um, African and that. Yes, so um, you might not um, exactly copy what was used in the US, but then you can copy the basic, the basics of how it, how it was successful. And if it can be translated into the local um, market, then that's also beneficial to both parties. So um, the national conferences are really important and now it's digital. So there's a lot of um, engagement, there's a lot of uh, participation. And for me, what I like about it is that both the diaspora and the locals are coming together to find solutions to challenges that they are facing in terms of, is it foreign affairs? Is it in terms of financial things? Is it in terms of philanthropy? So that collaboration for me is one of the big things I see with these national events. Thank you for that, Teresa. Uh, Jackie, Vivian, any comments in terms of the national conferences and sort of how you see it as a place for sharing results uh, of activities of diaspora? Uh, let me just go in just to continue from where Teresa left it. Um, for me, this is very, very important to have that because even nowadays you see them inviting, the way Teresa has just given, given an example of uh, Ghana, uh, you hear them call like if there's something, there's a delegation that is being sent to Kenya, to Ghana, to wherever, we are being called in. And if there's uh, some ministries coming from uh, Kenya who want to come to Germany, the first people they do a, a lot are uh, the diasporans. It's like, can you give us a view on this, on that? This is very important because it is time, it is a high time that we write our own stories. It has been written for us for quite some time. And by writing our own stories, this can make them understand us better because it is us going through this and not the people who are writing those stories. So we have to sit on that 
table with them, being called to the table, to table our problems, or to table our challenges, to table our, uh, how, do you go, how do you say that, uh, um, the good things that we've done all along and uh, all that we've gone through, that is always the best part. Talk to the people themselves and not about the people. So these dialogues and conferences are one of the best things that can ever happen for diaspora organizations and diaspora. Thank satellite. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for that. Um, and I hope that uh, Vivian can pick it up um, in the next set of questions that we will ask. Very nice to also see the conversations that are happening in the chat. Thank you for sharing in the questions uh, and also um, some of the reflections uh, that are coming in. Thank you so much in terms of what communication, uh, uh, you know, the place that communication should should have. And also particularly, I think uh, the link that communication should have in terms of the, the follow up, uh, but also the emphasis on ensuring that there is an integration of young migrants. Um, uh, into the whole ecosystem. I hope that uh, we'll be able to hear from you. Uh, I think it's Ndiaye, uh, Ndiaye, uh, thank you for, for sharing in. On espère qu'on va avoir l'opportunité pour entendre un petit peu votre point de vue à tout à l'heure. Merci. Thank you for that. And then just making a segue then to our, you know, our next point of reflection in this um, in this conversation so that we can be able to open the floor. I just wondered from our panelists, you know, we've talked about this sharing uh, of, of results of, of the various activities, the various platforms that you're using, the various means that you're using, uh, uh, the targeting also that is happening around the, the, the different uh, messages and the different results that you would like to share across. And I wonder, just as a final question, how can diaspora then align the goals that you have with the communication strategy? So maybe kicking off um, with Vivian, how do you sort of see that uh, that alignment between the goals that diaspora organizations or diaspora would have with their communication strategy? Vivian, the floor is yours. Okay, now I'm going to use the development of the Global Diaspora Humanitarian Hub as an instance. So we had consultation meetings where we had diaspora organizations come, share their needs, share their experiences, their opinion and recommendations. Afterwards, then we had a validation meeting, which is a follow-up meeting, basically a feedback, feedback loop, where we had them come back and say, okay, this is how far we have gone. Does this still align with your needs? Are we still on track? And then it also gives us time to be better prepared, go back, look at our goals, look at what we have done so far, and ensure that we're still in on track, still in line with the original goal that we had for that project. I think this is this is the best thing to do for every diaspora organization, a feedback system, a feedback loop. Don't just organize events and then say, okay, fine, we've gotten it. Have constant, continuous meetings, validation meetings, where these people come back and still share and see that, okay, we are still doing what we had originally discussed. So this is what we do. It gives us better time to be better prepared and ensure that we are not derailing from the purpose. We are not deviating because it's very easy to get distracted in project mm -hmm. implementation. So most times we'll go back and think back and look at what we have done and ensure that it's still in line. So feedback system, this is the best, the best system we can do, the best strategy to ensure that your goals are still aligning with your communication strategy. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Teresa, did you want to come in in terms about, you know, talking about this alignment between goals and communication strategy? Yeah. So in terms of that, it would go back to all that we've, uh, we've all said as panelists and as an audience and uh, you yourself. So it goes back to communication still being clear and consistent with the goals of the project. Um, it, 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 the language of the project and um, having an open mind for the latest trends in, com uh, in communication. Um, maybe I'll touch on that a little bit because of what technology has done to the way we communicate. So there are a lot of positives you can leverage from um, digitization. There are negatives too, but the positives are a lot if we, and we can use them in effective communication. So for example, for if we have targeted um, platforms, for let me use the Astra Digital News. So we have a resource um, 
um, page where we even post jobs, we have reports and everything. So it's like a one-stop center mm -hmm. for getting information on migration and diaspora uh, um, information. So that's also one way in which uh, we can align our goals with the communication. And the event that, that um, um, Vivian talked about, I think mm -hmm. GDC has organized lots of events. So I think that's why she mentioned that, uh, which I've also clearly followed, the Diaspora um, Humanitarian Hubs and the Global Diaspora Week and everything. So these things are also a great example. And speaking of the trends, one trend that I have noticed um, in terms of events for a lot of diaspora organizations and international organizations is the hybrid nature of the event. So the, it's a virtual event or it's an in-person event, but there's a side event which is being held virtually. So it's enabling um, a wider um, participation of all stakeholders from all around the world. So uh, Dr. Martin Russell of the Global Diaspora Insights, he always says that diaspora engagement should be high tech, but also high touch. So we should embrace digitization, but we shouldn't lose the human touch. As in, if there are um, opportunities to hold um, events in person, it's a great way of networking. It's even um, a more believable way of networking because we still have people who have doubts with technology and all that. So that blend of um, in offline, in-person, um, online kind of thing, it's a trend that I've noticed. Even the Global Diaspora Summit uh, last year was a hybrid event. We've had this... Um, is it the humanitarian and partnerships, um, networks and partnership we start going on right now? It's also a hybrid event. There's a UDIF Future Forum, Forum upcoming, I think in November. It's also going to be a hybrid event. So that way, people who cannot attend can also, at, in person, can also attend online. So it caters holistically for um, diaspora engagement. So if there's a project or there's an event which will allow for um, a hybrid nature. I think we should encourage that. So we cover all sides of um, engagement. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, Jackie, having heard about these different ways of aligning um, goals with communication strategies, I wondered whether if you could just Take us through what you see as sort of some of the important principles for alignment. Um, the first thing that one that we have to do is first of all to define our goals. That has been said by both Teresa and Vivian, and uh, we also have to involve all the parties and bring them on this board when we are communicating, because. Um, they will feel to be part of the project uh, other than when we keep them in the darkness during the whole project and we just don't communicate. Communication is key. The other thing is uh, there are three major uh, principles that I would like to touch on this. This is to understand the language, the culture. I think I I'd mentioned that before and just to listen to the people. Listening to the people is something that listening, the skill of listening, not all of us do have that because there's that deep listening. So some in a group like Quig, uh, I can say we are, uh, we are so lucky to have uh, Kenyans from all over. So a diversity of Kenyans. So if a sister or a brother um, from a different community has a problem, the first person we have to look within those who can help is somebody who has the cultural background, the same cultural background as this person and speaks the same language. I know most of us from, uh, uh, from Africa, we, we know that most of our countries have like several different kinds of languages, over 50 in a country, that, that is something that most Europeans never understand. And the diversity helps all of us uh, to improve our communication skill and to make us understand uh, 
the, the, the deepness of communication and makes that person you're communicating with feel like being understood. It is very important to understand the person. So um, the language and the culture and the listening, those are for me the most important things that I will put in there to help in the communication. That is Thank it. you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing these. And I'm just thinking as our panelists uh, have shared here in, in terms of looking at the strategies that we have for communication as diaspora and what diaspora organizations was, would put out as their goals and what that alignment looks like. But I think the wealth of, you know, the build up to the various questions that we've asked you and the rather the, the reflections that you, you have come in and how effective strategies, because our topic today is obviously to look at effective strategies and we're looking at effective strategies around communication, um, writing our own story. It's really been interesting to also to just hear in how we should be very much targeted and so on. And I know that in the audience, we have different members. We've also got members of civil society organizations that are supporters of diaspora or have all work with diaspora organizations. So I think it would be great for us to hear from, from everyone. Um, if you followed any of the questions and you wanted to give in your, your own opinion about this or share indeed how you in your own diaspora organizations or those that you work with who are partners of diaspora organizations, how you see effective strategies around communication, uh, please feel free to share with us because now we've opened the floor for us to hear it in. And I'm very happy to see that my big sister, Famba uh, Endoye um, is here with us in the room. Uh, ma grand sœur, vous avez la parole. Fambaye. Oui. Uh, bonjour. Bonjour, bienvenue, bonjour. merci. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Merci à ma petite sœur Padi uh, de nous avoir partagé ce lien qui nous permet aujourd'hui de participer à cette rencontre très importante à mon à mon avis. En fait, je suis très très contente qu'on puisse parler de de, de la diaspora. Et d'abord, je me présente, c'est Madame Fambeindoy, chef du département migration de l'Union nationale des syndicats autonomes du Sénégal, mais aussi présidente du euh, RAFEM qui est le réseau d'appui aux femmes et enfants en migration. Euh, donc, euh, aborder la communication par rapport à la diaspora euh, me semble très, très important. Euh, la diaspora, on a l'impression que la diaspora communique entre elle-même. Mais la communication de la diaspora avec les autres euh, organes ou associations de la société civile euh, euh, doit être améliorée. Euh, mais aussi... La diaspora doit avoir un regard critique sur ce que les autres communiquent sur la diaspora. En fait, l'essentiel des communications sur la diaspora tourne autour des envois de fonds. On dirait que la diaspora est une banque. Alors, contrairement à cela, le transfert de technologie est plus important. La participation de la diaspora au développement local est très importante. Mais nous demandons aussi plus de participation de la diaspora à la vie politique des pays, leur implication aux politiques publiques de leurs États. Cela me semble d'une importance capitale, surtout par rapport aux politiques d'emploi. Parce que si nous interrogeons les causes profondes de la migration, l'emploi y est en bonne place. Quelle communication la diaspora doit porter sur les politiques d'emploi des pays de destination et d'arrivée. C'est important. Quelle implication de la diaspora par rapport à l'évolution du droit social, c'est-à-dire des conditions de vie et de travail des travailleurs? Parce que euh, la diaspora, c'est avant tout des travailleurs. La diaspora travaille dans les pays d'accueil. Donc, ils sont, euh, euh, elles sont la diaspora est intéressée par l'évolution du droit social. Donc, une meilleure implication dans cette lutte aussi, c'est en fait une demande. Mais la communication aussi sur ce que fait la diaspora. 
pour permettre à ceux qui ont des projets qui peuvent s'inscrire dans leur ligne puissent avoir toutes les informations pour pouvoir y accéder. Certes, il y a des plateformes, mais l'accessibilité à ces plateformes, la communication qu'il faut pour que l'on puisse s'approprier de ces plateformes aussi demande des améliorations. Et euh, je pense qu'on a parlé de ces conférences aussi, qui sont des moments de communication et d'échange. Mais ces, 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 ces conférences doivent être plus ouvertes, plus inclusives pour permettre à d'autres d'y participer, d'échanger avec vous et de mieux comprendre vos stratégies, vos orientations. Cela aussi est, est en fait une demande. Mais le dernier point sur lequel je voulais un peu vous dire, c'est que nous disons toujours que la migration au niveau régional est interne à 80%. Donc la migration africaine, elle est d'abord africaine. Donc cette diaspora Afrique-Afrique aussi doit être plus visible et plus audible. Sur les questions qui interpellent nos espaces régionaux, je vais parler de la CDAO et de l'Union africaine. La diaspora aussi doit plus s'impliquer sur les instruments au niveau de ces, de ces, de ces, de ces espaces-là, au niveau de la CDAO, au niveau de, de l'Union africaine, pour voir, en fait, sur les questions de mobilité, où il y a des aspects que nous dénonçons et que nous continuons de dénoncer. Quel apport la diaspora, euh, surtout Afrique, Afrique, euh, puisse euh, euh, donner un peu ses avis et impliquer sur, sur un peu la dynamique de la progression des, 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 des accords et des traités au niveau de notre continent. Euh, merci Padi, voilà les quelques points sur lesquels je voulais un peu euh, revenir. Et merci pour cette belle opportunité. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for sharing in those reflections and very important um, uh, points that you have alluded to. And uh, thank you so much also for highlighting to us the diversity that's there around diaspora and talking also predominantly about the African diaspora that is within Africa. And that's often um, sometimes remains neglected or whose contributions uh, as well remain invisible. Um, and, and thank you for bringing in that. But I think also the communication, the, the first point that you raised in terms of ensuring that diaspora communicates with others, uh, the, the communication between diaspora and others also has to improve so that the visibility is really indeed beyond remittances um, and, and looks beyond diaspora um, as a cash machine, as, as, as has been paraphrased in other spaces, and how diaspora can actually be real actors in the political and development space uh, in, 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 the, in the homelands. Um, coming in to, I know Dr. Raj, I just wanted to check if you are here with us in the room and you would like to share with us. I think I did see a comment in the chat. So just checking, it says invitee. It may be that you have not managed to um, change your name uh, in the group. Uh, Dr. Raj, you want to take the floor? Yes, okay. please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paddy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's important. Communication is important and it has been emphasized uh, that effective com communication at all levels, whether at the level of the project, um, uh, thinking of the project and implementation and the communities that benefit from that, that project. I, I want to flag this issue of diaspora as an effective partner in development, because we are talking about the SDGs, how the diaspora can contribute to the implementation of the SDGs as well. That what is the, what's the thinking among diaspora groups? Do they want to be at the seat, at the, at the table with governments when it comes to doing development projects, or would they rather be independent? that they don't want to be controlled by governments, whether at the municipal level or state level or country level, or, or that they would like to operate as independent development partners, but themselves, but have nothing to do with, you know, because the governments often, sometimes, well, sometimes they, de they derail what you're doing because they have certain bureaucratic issues to, to comply with and so on. So what's the feeling of diaspora groups? That's one, whether they would like to have a seat 
at the table with politicians? Do they want to be recognized as development partner? And secondly, the other thing I have in mind is that how do they conceive of projects? Do they just say, okay, you know what? In my village, I, they need X, Y, Z, and I'm going to start working on that. Or do they go to the constituents and ask them, what are your dire needs and how these needs are changing and how they can accommodate those needs and, you know, and how they can go back to them and say, okay, this is what we are doing. What do you think you can do? How can you partner with us? Uh, so, so it's both at the mini level and macro level uh, engagement of diaspora. Thank you very much. Dr. Hart, thank you for those insightful questions to our panelists. Um, and yes, indeed, do diaspora want to be given the seat uh, and be recognized as um, development partners? Or is this uh, a big assumption that uh, countries, families and communities uh, back home seem to be making? So it would be very interesting to hear from our panelists as well as you will respond to that, but also particularly talking about communication around projects. How do projects actually become conceived? So that will really be interesting um, to hear a little bit uh, uh, later on from our panelists. I realized that we also had some other questions um, that uh, came into, into the group, but I think one was actually also a share. But I wondered if uh, Moinime Ndiaye, est-ce que vous pouvez parler? Vous avez la parole? Okay, we may have seemed to 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 have lost uh, Ndiaye there, uh, but uh, yet again, I think thank you for the contributions that came through the chat in in talking about um, communication being very very critical, but also in us ensuring that we are bringing young people into the ecosystem. And I think maybe that would be an important point as our panelists are coming to circle back uh, in in wrapping up. Where do you see communication, effective communication for the young? Uh, for the youth and young adults. Uh, so, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we, how are you working or what do you visualize as some of those important tools? I know TikTok is some of the, one of the things that really often comes up when we talk about communication. I mean, it's, it, it's there even for four-year-olds these days, they know that TikTok exists. And then, you know, you would see some of us still fidgeting with our phones and trying to figure out um, how TikTok actually works. But I think that there is something to be said uh, in, in, in some of these different spaces. Um, um, interesting enough, uh, having also a conversation with diaspora around uh, COVID times in seeing how family members became even much more vigilant in the use of WhatsApp. So, you know, grandmothers could even make video calls, you know, things that never used to happen before and join Zoom calls. Uh, and so, you know, how, how does that look like in your world in terms of dealing with younger people as well? So it would be interesting uh, to hear a little bit more. But I think one of the other things that Ndiaye had raised was also um, uh, the voice uh, for, for, you know, it's, not 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 speaking on behalf of others, but actually allowing um, other, those that are concerned to be able to uh, speak in their own name. So we'll, it would be interesting as well to hear where is the place for diaspora themselves in the messaging. So that would be interesting to hear. Uh, do we have anyone else who would like to share some contributions? I see there were some shares as as well. That continues again, uh, Veronica. Thank you very much on uh, sharing. Um, uh, the, the link that would allow people to to engage further on after this uh, this this uh, webinar is done here, um, and with that we can have other people sharing. But maybe we circle back to our panelists. Uh, Vivian, what do you what do you think around some of the questions that Dr. Raj has put across? Uh, Fambaye also has brought up some uh, interesting challenges uh, there as well. Which you can pick any of these questions and feel free to address it. Vivian, the floor is yours. Reading from the chat, um, how do diaspora groups identify projects and communicate this to beneficiary communities? So basically, through these events, these online events, it's amazing how people have a lot of challenges that they are waiting to voice out. They are looking for channels to share. During these meetings that we have had at GDC, I have come to realize that there is so much to be done. 
in diaspora engagement. So this is one way of identification. Another way is social media. Most of these diaspora groups also share their events, share what they need on their social media platform, especially Facebook. I realize that Facebook is an effective tool for most diaspora communities. They have these communities here, there on Facebook where they share their challenges. So one can plug in and, and see that, okay, this need, this is a need for diaspora communities and then find a way to develop a project around it and form partnerships because diaspora organizations, partnerships is key within diaspora organizations so that your work can be more effective. So I would say most of these events, and there are so many events happening regularly. You just have to be on the lookout. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, you will definitely see one or two that you could attend. And you'd be amazed at how much help that diaspora communities and organizations need. So this is one way to identify projects and also share back with your beneficiary communities. Thank you, Vivian. Um... Jackie, what are your thoughts on this? Um, there are questions that have been put up there. So I wonder if I just pick up a question or I continue with Vivian's uh, part. You um, can pick a question, maybe also talking about engagement with uh, young diasporans and also the picking of different projects. Yeah. There are There is a question that has been, or two different questions that have been put out there by Dr. Raj, whether we want to uh, have a seat with the government uh, with the government. And the other one is whether it is us just deciding for those back home on which projects uh, suits them. These two questions um, suit together because first and foremost, for, for me, if, if I am asked that question, I'll answer it this way. For them to know what we are going through, what is good for us diasporans, they have to sit with us on a table. Of course, we can have, uh, we still have our groups working and the work streams uh, of different diaspora groups, associations working, but to sit with us on that table so that we can tell them, this is what is affecting us on the ground. Uh, there's, um, there's a, a work stream or part of the diaspora group, part of Quig, uh, that, and also a group that calls itself Kenya, African nurses, They've started a work stream that goes like bringing in the nurses from Kenya that they cannot do it on their own. They need the government because this is a policy that has to be put out there uh, and to be passed by the government. So this is a place where I say we need them. We need to sit with them. We have to say, OK, we've realized you have a shortage in this work stream, we've realized there's a shortage over there. Why can't we partner together so that it can be closed down, the gap can be closed down. We need them to sit it out, to sit down with them. The other thing is the same way we need to be sitting with them on the table here is the same way we cannot identify a project there and just work uh, uh, on the, and start working on it. It is the people at home to tell us, of course, we have to do our due diligence. We have to go there, we have to check it out first, but it is them to tell us what they need. You will never know what the other person needs until the person tells you. You might be thinking you're going to help, but you're just bringing things in surplus. You're doing a surplus instead of help, helping um, effectively. So both sitting on both tables is very, very important to have to define a goal and to know exactly what you're going to help at. Thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing in those reflections. Um, Teresa, did you want to come in and share with us um, reflections, uh, your last reflections as we, as we wrap up? Yeah, same on uh, Dr. Raj's question to so continue from where um, Jackie left off. I think um, with diaspora organizations, they don't like to be to have the political tag, because then again, I'll use Ghana as an example. For 30 years, we've had about four different governments from the same different parties, but then it's been like a, an eight year cycle for each government. And um, people who usually affiliate to one government, when that government is out of power, they face a lot of challenges. There are a lot of stories like that. So I think um, a lot of diaspora organizations, 
would prefer to be independent partners, development partners. And there are lots of people who have done that. There are lots of organizations who have done that and it's worked for them. So regardless of whichever government is in power, they are able to partner, to collaborate, to get their views across. So it's, it's tricky because you still need the government's intervention. You still need the government support. A lot of diaspora organizations don't have a, a communication strategy or a communications wing or a marketing wing because they don't have the funding, right? So then if they have support from government, that would help. But then does that also translate into the government um, kind of showing them what to do, when to voice out, when to support? So it's kind of tricky. I think maybe like we said um, earlier, we could share, um, we could learn from independent development partners, how it worked for them and um, um, what we can learn from them. And also I think diaspora media is a big part of it. Um, not because I'm from the diaspora media, but Veronica just shared I diaspora. I diaspora, I think um, at the end of last year to the beginning of this year, I saw they were sharing um, about youth in the diaspora. They were sharing their experiences. There were people from all over the world. So they are, I think they're very engaging. There was a photo contest last year and there's there's been a lot of things so i think also the diaspora organizations should approach the media mm -hmm. for we have people who send us um press releases and we publish it we don't we don't make any financial demands so, because we are also advocating for it and in dealing with i diaspora they are very embracing too so if you don't contact them you might be complaining that oh your stories are not being told but what what attempts have you also made? Because most of the diaspora media I know, and the typical example is I diaspora. They are very embracing. They are a global platform. So I think diaspora um, organizations should also think about the communications part of it. Because if you're thinking of communications, then you think of PR, then you think of contacting the media and all that. I know funding is a problem, but most of these things you can do them for free even on social media and like i said that's why digital i diaspora there are people you can contact to get your message across so i believe um organizations can also leverage on this jackie feel free to come in um i think um i i totally agree with uh Teresa. Teresa, believe me uh quig will be uh contacting you sooner or later <laughs> but there's a difference that i kind of think we have to define which government mm -hmm. i spoke i had a feeling Teresa spoke about the government of our home countries and i was speaking about the government in germany so that we should differentiate which government do we want to sit on the table with or which government are we not sitting on the table with so uh, for me I will, it it is the government of this country of germany that i would like to sit and discuss such matters that affect us as diasporas here but when i am going back home going to the government of my home country because this is something that I'm now bringing to them. I, I, we better be independent because we know most of those governments, uh, when you are too much into one party, when they fall, you also fall. Yeah. It will be a bit difficult again to join when the new party comes in. And that is something that Teresa mentioned. So the government that I was speaking about was the one in Germany and not in the home country. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. just something that I wanted to make clear. No, that's a very interesting perspective, actually, Jackie, I think bringing it in is in terms of building trust. And I think that Vivian had also touched on this. And it's also one of the topics uh, that uh, together with iDiaspora, um, GRFDT, CSUN, and, and, and the African platform that uh, looks, uh, the, the ADEPT, as it is called, uh, there was a publication actually that's available. And maybe I will ask um, that uh, uh, Veronica, if that could also be posted in here where we're talking about building trust. And essentially, this is also the point that, you know, engagement, communication strategies, and everything that has to do with the life of a diaspora organizations, its goals, its ambitions, and its activities 
in the homeland or even in the country of residence or the country of destination, uh, depending on how you see that, uh, would really depend on the level of trust, isn't it? That is there as well. So it's also in setting the seat. Uh, what is the level of trust? What is the level of partnership? Um, and it also speaks a lot into mobilizing your resources as well as uh, sustaining these relations, right? Uh, are we really seen as independent partners? And sometimes maybe you'd see things shifting from one space to another. But I feel that uh, and this is me kind of speaking out my notes to uh, to Larissa and Veronica in in the back room, but also other organizers. Maybe in terms of the next uh, the next kind of topics that we need to look at, you know, uh, that we don't take a lot of things for granted when we talk about you know uh, diaspora as development partners, and maybe it's sort of in which context that we have to look at it. And I guess you know people would have different uh, different uh, sharings on this particular one. I think we still had one more question before uh, I will ask the panelists to take a break so we can get some um, some 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 closing remarks. I was just going to check on it, and yes, indeed, it's from. Um, uh, uh, part of the core organizers. So Larissa writes there, there are international frameworks implemented uh, in monitoring and evaluation, for instance, the OECD evaluation criteria, which looks at relevance, coherence, effectiveness, uh, efficiency, impact, and sustainability. Now, can these type of frameworks be applied in diaspora engagement? And specifically, how would we use them to extract key activity achievements and communicate results. I don't know if Teresa, Vivian, whoever has, you know, just feel free to uh, to go through this. Uh, I mean, I would talk it through so that maybe we can digest it a little bit. Of course, in the space of evaluation, uh, we've got bodies that create some kind of a criteria, you know. So when we are when when projects have been implemented. There's a type of framework or two that you use for your monitoring and evaluation. And with the OECD, they've set up a number of criteria, and those are the criteria that you go in to evaluate a project. And these are the kind of criteria they would use for development projects, if you like, or, or, or different types of projects that are being implemented. So there's a, a kind of guideline uh, that has been adapted to even in the monitoring and evaluation space, where you look at is the project relevant? Uh, how coherent is it to national policies, to the needs uh, of the beneficiaries? Uh, it talks also about effectiveness. Do you want to measure effectiveness of the, of the project activities or the outputs that are coming out? Do you want to look at things like efficiency? How efficient have the project, the use of resources and so on. Uh, what about impact uh, and sustainability? Um, and then I will also take my evaluators part here and say that sometimes it is very difficult to talk about impact uh, depending on which time of the project is being evaluated. But just thinking about this and this kind of frameworks, and there are many others. Uh, I know, for instance, on the African continent, you also have some principles of evaluation from the African Evaluation Association. But at the national level, you also have different uh, national groups trying to sort of say all kinds of projects need to be subject to some kind of criteria for evaluating them. So the question is, can we use these types of frameworks to diaspora projects? What are your thoughts around that? Vivian, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> sure, that's fine. You know, in the beginning, I said that strategic communication ensures sustainability of projects. And yes, these frameworks can be applied in diaspora engagement because in the end, you want to be sure that your project is relevant, it, it is impactful, and it can be sustained throughout the project cycle. So I believe that these kind of frameworks should be employed in diaspora engagement because it would also help in effectiveness. It would help in the, generally in the successful implementation of such diaspora projects. And as an m and &E enthusiast, these key indexes that have been listed here are, are, are very sufficient, in my opinion, to ensure that projects are implemented successfully. So yes, to answer the question, it is yes. And I think it had also been mentioned earlier how to communicate results through reports, um, through validation meetings, to ensure that you, you check, you have a check uh, with your project against these performance indexes to ensure that everything went according to plan. So yes, this is my opinion. This is my take on it. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, Jackie, any thoughts of how you, you see the application of these global frameworks on evaluation to the projects that you're implementing as quick? 
Well, thanks very much for that. And actually, um, of Vivian's opinion, because uh, this evaluation needs to be done and uh, it shows the, uh, the correctness. It shows that the money that has been put out there is being used in the direct place and to implement it. It shows the, um, uh, it's the accountability of the whole thing which uh, helps the donors or the sponsors even to, be, uh, to want to continue working with different diaspora organizations. I'm for a yes on this. Thank you, thank you so much. Teresa, what are your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I, I also agree because um, the guidelines of these um, frameworks and they are proving things that are proving. They've been uh, put together by international organizations and they are proving methods of how things will work in terms of evaluation and uh, monitoring and evaluation. And so in terms of the application though, it might be different depending on the which diaspora you are um, trying to implement. But with the guidelines, I think it should work across, not totally, but it could work across. Just that with the implementation, you have to consider, like we said, the language, the audience, their culture and everything. So it might not be one size fitting all, but I believe it's a great way to start. When you have the guidelines, yeah, you, you, you can build on that and then you can, um, you can bring it into um, your own um, culture or you can diversify it in a way that fits your project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so by all means, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. I think a good take um, from all our panelists that indeed they are applicable, but they have to work within the context. And I feel like, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, bringing in also my take there uh, as moderator of the session, as I think this is what everybody seems to talk about in terms of any kind of framework that's out there. I think, Teresa, you also talked about sort of some of the examples that we would see of best practices of different things. Um, around communication strategies that could work in one place, work in another place, but it's really about uh, tailoring it to the environment uh, that it's in. So while frameworks uh, may be widely available, that tailoring also remains very important. And often, as one would say, you know, we don't want to also turn, um, you know, diaspora, uh, diaspora partners and actors into a mainstream uh, type of work, but that they remain engaged as diaspora and engage with these different platforms, but are allowed to work uh, in the space that gives them the level of independence, the level of comfort, and also that, uh, you know, the, the advocacy and all the other activities that have brought them together remain authentic. Uh, so I think that's that's very important and thank you for sharing that. I know I see much more reflections coming in. It's always like this um, when we're at the end, but I also realize that we're running against time. Uh, I see there are some more questions. Thanks again, Nandiaye, for sharing those questions in terms of uh, you know integration of, uh, of, of migrants in, into different countries. But I think that we've touched on some of these aspects that have been shared in various uh, in, in but by the various panelists in different ways in how they engage for instance also with young people that's another question that's been raised and Fambaya again thank you for uh, sharing in your uh, your reflection in terms of the use of evaluation criteria for uh, for particular projects and that they have to really be um, uh, uh, better elaborated, I think, at the same time in looking at the type of evaluation in question. So very much echoing what has been shared also by our panelists. I think we are at a good juncture to make a, a, a small run to the closing. Uh, 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 and I will now um, call upon Natalia. Natalia, here you are. Natalia is here. And Natalia, if you could give us some uh, closing remarks uh, from your side. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you for the floor. Um, as Fadi already mentioned, uh, my name is Natalia Kosowska and I'm here representing the Migration, Youth and Children platform, MYCP. Um, but before I delve into the final remarks and um, summarize what has been said during the past two hours, um, I would like to bring you closer to what MYCP stands for and how the organization as well as 
am related to the youth diaspora. And so Mben YCP is a self-organized space of more than 100 entirely remote youth volunteers who facilitate and coordinate the engagement of thousands of youth-led organizations. And 56% of our team members are diaspora members located all over the world with our six thematic and five regional teams. So we are truly encompassing and connecting the youth diaspora globally. And with our work, we aim to progress youth and children's voices, issues, challenges, and provide recommendations at the local, regional, and international levels. On a more personal note, I am also I also experience what it's like to be a migrant myself. Um, I was born and raised in Poland, but at 17, I moved to Slovakia and a few years later to the Czech Republic and further in 2020 to the Netherlands, where I am based right now. Um, so I have a first-hand experience with what it's like to be youth on the move in search of better educational and employment opportunities. And during the time, I witnessed how migrants are more than capable of contributing to the origin, host, and transit countries. Yet there's a lot of untapped potential in terms of engaging diaspora youth, even though we constitute a significant proportion of current and future diaspora. That's why I believe that strategic communication and building engagement with the partners is so, so pivotal for the visibility and success of diaspora projects that like no other understand the lived experiences of migrants and first and second and third generations. That's why for diaspora mobilization, we need strategic communication. And as part of the strategic communication, it is crucial that the diaspora organizations also share their expertise in the international debate on migration issues and outcomes of their local projects, so that they can promote diaspora contribution among governments and our stakeholders. And one of the examples is MYCP's work as a steering group that's mandated for facilitating youth engagement and youth diaspora contributions to the Global Forum on Migration Development, GFMD. And currently, we are actually organizing a call for projects, and this call will allow lo local youth-led projects focused on the socio-cultural contributions to the diaspora and migrants to showcase their work at an international GFMD event in Paris. So if you would like to participate yourself or you know any organization that would like to participate, please join our network, and the link will be shared at the iDiaspora event page for today's event, where you will also access today's session recording. So now uh, let's get into what has been said. I made a lot of notes and I think the things that were said by Teresa, Vivian and Jacqueline were so inspiring that I just couldn't put everything into, into what I've just written. I think that one thing that stood out to me is that strategic communication is such a versatile tool that is crucial for every aspect of the diaspora's activity. And the session has actively reminded us why strategic communication is so important. Um, I have a few quotes from Vivian, Teresa, and Jacqueline. So Vivian said that there are good ideas that get lost in the communication, right? Um, well, Teresa said that communication is how the receiver takes the message and the outcome is how we can achieve the goals of the project and align it with the vision. While Jacqueline highlighted that communication is a whole when there is a message with a meaning that is being shared and there's also a need to collaborate with other um, diaspora actors. Um, we need to also define the goals we want to achieve, the age group, the relevant platform for them, the socio-political context of our target audience. And we can never overemphasize the use of the social media because this is crucial also for gaining feedback that actually can align the communication strategy um, with the goals. Um, and strategic communication allows to build partnerships. It allows to explain needs and challenges of the organization, but also it allows us to know that we do not need to duplicate the project that's already there. Um, and someone also in the audience mentioned that we need more connections among the diaspora community to maximize our activity. So if we duplicate the projects and what we do, we cannot actually fill in the gaps that need to be addressed. Um, so for strategic communication, the organizations have to be on top of everything. And what was surprising for me to hear was that the importance of the packaging of the message, especially during crisis time. And that's what Teresa highlighted um, in her, uh, while, while she spoke that, for example, we need to make the message exciting and um, make it more human because migration ultimately is about human beings. And we need to make it inclusive and appeal to people's emotions, but to communicate the message in a professional way so that our point comes across. 
Um, and I think what really stood out to me is that one of the most profound strategies to maximize the communication skills is, in Jackie's words, to understand the language, the culture, and the fact that we need to actively listen to people to, to address what has to be addressed. And last but not least, um, today's session has shown us that what we need to change about our approach to effective communication is that we need to highlight the good things that are happening. Um, how do we identify that and how to make we, we make sure that these stories are being told? We need to still figure that out, but I think it's not the, the hardest part of that. Um, we also need to start collaborating more so that we can change the, the image of diaspora's impact that goes beyond the topic of remittances. And there are also a lot of things that diaspora can contribute to, um, but we need to share the impact of our activities. And we need to frame the presence of diaspora as a win-win situation for the country of origin and the host country. And we need to allow diaspora to speak for themselves rather than be spoken on behalf of. So it is the time to give a seat for diaspora by the decision-making table, but it is up to diaspora to decide by which table they want to sit. Thank you so much to all the speakers, Vivian, Vivian Theresa, Jacqueline, and Patty for moderating the session, as well as Monica for your wonderful remarks. I hope each of us can take something from today's session to our daily lives, and I'm more than sure about that. And I would also like to thank IOM iDiaspora, especially Larissa and Vera, for the opportunity to have my voice and the voice of the youth in such a great, diverse company. Natalia, what a wonderful way to uh, have wrapped up um, this conversation. I don't think I would have done it any better than you did and bringing in these very different elements from our various panelists, um, from our three panelists that joined us today. But I think also in setting the scene from where Monica started us from um, in terms of this really being a, that learning event. And I feel you've really wrapped up very well those lessons that we can take away. Um, and I think as often people would ask, so what happens after this? Well, immediately after, which is on the 2nd of May, and I will ask that um, Veronica would put up if we still have the, the poster, or I think we have a link in the chat. Uh, so we will have on May the 3rd, um, yes, thank you, on May the 3rd, uh, the next and the final session that we will have in terms of the global diaspora virtual exchanges um, in this particular space where we'll be looking at impactful skills. Um, and I think we will share with you in the chat in a little bit uh, so that you are able to sign up very similar process to how it was on this or, or on, on this one uh, and we will be able to engage with you uh, and information will be shared through the various uh, twitter linkedin um, and other tools that we use to communicate upcoming events from the various core organizers so we're really glad that you're able to join us today and we hope that you are making time uh, to join us yet again for the for for the next date. I know we've been asked questions around uh, people logging in and Zoom and so on. I could see some messages also coming through. Once you register, you will get a link that uh, that gives you a personal link. And in this particular third session, we are just trying to really dive in. And and then again, I'm reminded the third one is on innovative tools. We had the last one on impactful skills. Today, we looked at effective strategies. And the third one will be on innovative tools. And I'm very excited to be able to be in that group, in that audience, and listen in uh, as that, that session is going to take place. So it's taking place on the 3rd of May and 3 p.m. same time. So it will run for two hours as well, 3 p.m. Uh, European time. And we're looking forward to you joining us for that session. And after that session, we hope that we'll be able to share with you the results of what these uh, different conversations have come to. And we'll share a little bit more um, on what will happen. More immediately after this, we would appreciate if you could fill out a survey link that is going to be shared. Um, and it's coming up right now on your screen. So we didn't want to leave the room as often that happens, people would be able to dash out for your different engagements. So if you could just take a few moments to uh, fill out the survey um, and you will see that we only have four questions that's there. 